which is morphology. When we talk about fa'lan and fa'il, that's all sub, the structure of the words, all right? And then, uh, sixthly, you need to know balagha, which is eloquence in Arabic, eloquence. And if you have those, uh, the, you don't have to be masters of it, if you have a, a general understanding of those six sciences, you can open up a Quran and have a good dictionary, and you can really dive in, okay? So we're going to do a general introduction to Nahu. Just by show of hands, who has studied Nahu uh, with a teacher? Who studied Nahu with a teacher? Okay, all right, one, two, three, okay. All right, of course, of course. <laughs> of course. Where were you in England? Blackbird. Blackbird, So, I'm going to introduce what are called the ahwal of the words. Ahwal of kalimah. So there are basically four ahwa, there are four states, there are four moods that Arabic words fall into. Right? Just like sometimes you're happy, you're sad, you're angry, or Arabic words have moods. Yeah, there's only four. Today we're only going to look at three of them. Because really, to be able to fact, you just need to know three of those moods. So there's what's called ha la turaf. The state of Rafa. Okay? And then we have what's called Halatu Nasl. Okay? The state or the mood, if you want to be really grammatically accurate. We say the case of Muslim. Arabic, like Latin, the words in Arabic have case endings. And you already know them. I'm going to give you an example. You already know this. You just may not know that you know them. Okay. And then the last one we're going to look at today is called Halatul Jab or Halatul Khat, depending on which method you follow. So it's the state of Jab. Okay? Jab. <clears throat> now, rafa, raf means to be raised, to be elevated. And this is the normal, natural state of a noun or a verb in Arabic. Remember Arabic words fall into how many uh, categories of speech? Four. Three. 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 I thought you said four, you only do one. No, these are the states of the, the endings of the words, okay. but the parts of speech are three. So in English we have eight, some say nine parts of speech. In Arabic we have three parts of speech. Ism, fil, haf, right? Ism, and, ism, har. Noun, verb, particle. Noun, verb, particle. Noun, verb. That's it. Three parts of speech, okay? Now, nouns and verbs fall under these three states. Verbs have a, a fourth one, right, that they fall under, and now they do it. And uh, <coughs> when you look at each of these, this first one, Halatarafa, is the natural state. And I like to call it the fitra state of the word. You know fitra? Every infant is born on the natural, innate, primordial state. Okay. So when a word is in its natural state, it's called rafa. It's raised, it's elevated. When a word has a particle that precedes it, or it's the object of a verb, it's receiving an action, or it's adverbial, it's qualifying a verb, it enters this state, the state of nasab. Right? Nasab means to be firm, right? 
which means to be firm. All right, so this is a state of uh, of being made uh, firm. Okay, I can't think of another name for it, but maybe it's not safe for Imam. I like to develop, I don't really like this again, but we'll finish up. We're developing it. <laughs> and then the last one, jab. Jab comes from a word in Arabic which means to pull, to drag. Jab. What does jab mean? To drag, to pull. It's also called khabd. 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 Khabd means to lower. So it's the opposite of rafa. Raf is to elevate, that's the fitra state, your natural state, the natural state of the word, whereas khaf is to lower. See that? Right? Raise, raf, khaf is to lower. When does a word enter the jab state or the khaf state? There's only two times. Either when it's preceded by a preposition, Okay, prepositions like min, ila, ala, and fi. Right? There are other prepositions, but these are some of the more common ones you find in the Quran. Min, what does min mean? From. Oh, now you guys keep falling for it. It doesn't mean anything. It's a part of that. But it generally means from. Well, this is the context of the sentence. Ila means to, ala means on, fi means in, 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 right? Okay. Or when it's in a uh, what's called a idafa construct. What is a idafa construct? I'm going to say it, so I'm not going to write it because it's too long for me to write. Idafa construct is when you have two nouns that have a relationship. You put them together. When you have two nouns that are side by side in Arabic and they have a relationship, you call them idafa. The first noun, the first noun can be rough state, not some state, or jab state. But the second noun is always jab. Why? Because it's following the other one. It's being dragged around. Why is the, the, the noun that comes after min, ila, ala, fi, jar? Because it's following the preposition. Okay. So again, how the rough is the normal state. It's the fitra state. D, this. To direct. Between. I like that. Between rafa and rafa. It's being directed by something? Direct. Ah, okay, that's true. Direct meaning. Uh, between Rafa. Uh, between Rafa and God. Uh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So let's try that to direct to be directed. When it's being ordered, right? To be directed. Alright? We'll try that. Alright, so so this is a basic introduction to the ends of words. Okay? Now, Arabic grammar just deals with the ends of words. That's all it deals with. When we talk about Arabic grammar, we're looking at the end of a word. And in English, words used to, the ends of words used to change. So they still change. So we have the, thou, and thou. Right? The, thou, and thou. So thou, right, thou shalt not kill. That's the rough state. Right? You're, you are the subject of the sentence. Thou, right? This book belongs to, do we say thou? In all English? No. This book belongs to thee. Nasr. See, thou became thee. And uh, thy, thy, for example, in thy in, sorry? In thy something. Right, in thy presence. Right? This is an example of hot. Now in Arabic, the different states 
have different endings. The basic ending for words that are in Rafa is with U, Baba. This is, this is really important. And now when you read the Quran, you start to look for this. The basic sign for words that are state of Nasr is Fatha. Ah. They will end with an ah. And the basic vowel, the default vowel for words that end in Jal state or the Khaf state is Kasr. E. Dhamma for Raf. Right? Nasr. Fatha for Nasr. And of course, khaf is kasra, even the sign is under the line. And khaf means the lower. The sign is lower itself. The rough state is the state the human being is in when you are free from being acted upon by other particles or verbs. Other actions where you're not being acted upon by part of a, a, the only time a word is going to enter, go from the fifth state, which is the state where you're not attached, you're not connected to anything, nothing's affecting you, nothing's giving you headache, nothing's, is when you go into Nasa. When you go into Nasa, when particles start to act on you, or verbs start to act on you, right? When things that have no meaning and things that are in time have effect on you, right? <laughs> and the only time you're pulled behind something is when you develop a relationship with it or there's some kind of physical uh, or non-physical attachment to the state. So let's look at this. Al Fatiha. Now, are there any questions about this? I saw a hand up. Any questions or comments about this? Okay, Alright, so we're gonna go through Fatiha, we're gonna keep going through. The, uh, the meanings of the words, but we're also going to look at the endings of the words. These endings help to tell us what's going on. Now, you know these endings already. When you call the Adam, when you call, before you call the Adam, when you say the Shahada, the Shahada time, what do we say? La ilaha illallah, Muhammad, do Rasulullah, right? We say Muhammad, Dun Rasulullah, don't we? It ends with a Bamata. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. When you call the Adhan, we say, Ashadu anna Muhammad Dan. It changes from Muhammadun to Muhammad Dan. That's grammar. You say it every day, all right. Ashadu anna Muhammad dan. And when you recite the Salat Ibrahimiya, the Abrahamic benediction in the Salah, you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. See, you guys are really grammar. It becomes kasta. So the ala, see, preposition. Ala Muhammad. Ala Muhammad. Ashadu anna particle. I'm sorry. Anna Muhammad. Anna Muhammad. It's preceded by a particle. And then Muhammad Rasulullah, there's nothing influencing it, so it's free. Right. These are the default signs. And there are other signs that take their place depending on the kind of work. And I'm going to, we're going to look at some of these as we go through. But I just wanted you to have a general idea of the states of the words as they relate to meaning and to their general default signs, shall we So let's go to the next item. And so on the fatah. And as we go through this, we will add other signs. Okay, so 
just so that you know, particles do not have any state. Particles, like B that we began with, men, ila, ala, fi, they don't go through moves. They are called mabni. What are they called? Mabni. Mabni means they're fixed. They don't change. They don't change. Mabni. Whereas the nouns and verbs, they change. They change. Even nouns change? Yes. Like Muhammad. Muhammadun. Muhammadan. Muhammadun. The endings change. Well, when we say change, we mean the, the, the ending. The, why does the ending change? To tell us it has a different meaning. Not and the, the word itself, the meaning hasn't changed. It's the function it's playing in the sentence that changes. The role of the word in the sentence changes, and we indicate that in Arabic, in Latin, before in English, you don't do it so much now in English, uh, we use the endings of the words to show, okay, now this word is playing a different function in the sentence. Right? And when you read Arabic, and you read the Quran, this is very, very, very important. Can you give an example? Yes. So for example, Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ Alright? So Allah says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ من عباده العلا ما أو. Alright. This is an eye of the Quran. Now, if a person just saw this, right, let's take out the vowels. If a person just saw this and they did not understand Arabic and they didn't have a sound aqida, sound tawhid, they would read this and would look like they should read this with yaksha being the verb, because it is a verb, it means to fear based with knowledge, to have all. And they would make Allah's name the doer. The doer. They would put it in the rough state. And then basically they would say, only Allah fears from his slaves the scholars. Well, the other one. If you don't know Arabic, then your aqidah is... Right? But so in the Quran, this name, the name of Allah, has a fatwa on it to show that it's not rough, it's not the doer of the verb, it's receiving the action of the verb. He's not the one who's afraid, he's the one who is feared. And al-ulama, scholars, al-ulama, has a dogma to show that it's what? It's the subject of the verb. It's the doer of the verb. It's the five. Even though it comes at the end. Arabic is a, a synthetic language. Whereas English is a non-synthetic language. A synthetic language is a language where word order does not necessarily indicate the meaning. So I can say, for example, Baraba Zaydunamra. Zay hit Amr. Right? And in English you would say Zay hit Amr. Or I could say Daraba Amra Zaydun. Right? Yes. <laughs> That's my life, right? In every grammar book is always uh, hitting. <laughs> you know? <laughs> People are always hitting each other. Zay and Amr always fight. Alright, so, but no matter how I change the, the order of the words, as long as I keep Zayd as in a rough state with Dhamma, and I keep Amr with Nasr, anyone who understands Arabic will know Zayd is the one who's, who loves Amr, right? Or who's hearing Amr, right? But in English, you can't say that. If I say Zayd loves Amr, you know who is Zayd loves Amr. If I say Amr loves Zayd, it changes. But in Arabic, I can say Amr loves Zayd, and it can still mean Zayd loves Amr. It's because of the Indians. Got it? Love 
Okay, but so let's go through these inshallah. So based on what you now know, now you are yes. So you said Arabic is a synthetic. Synthetic means that meaning is not dependent on word order. It also means that a, a that the, the, the language is based on a system of roots, and those roots have multiple layers of meaning. That's what it's called in linguistics synthetic. Synthetic languages. Hebrew is a synthetic, uh, synthetic language as well. Farsi. Farsi, yeah. Semitic, oh. Semitic, 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 Semitic. Yes, Semitic means uh, it's from Sham or Shem. Shem. So okay, but so let's go go back to Fatima. So based on what we know, the word Ismi is what state? Uh, Jab. Jab. It's Jab because it follows B, follows a preposition. And the name of Allah, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Ar Allah. Do you see the number there? I'm sorry. Jab. Jab? Yeah. Is everyone following? How do we know the Jab? They all end in Kasra. Bismillahi, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Mi. They all end in Jab. What is that telling us? It's telling us at least two things. Number one, that there's a connection between the word Allah and the word ism. Because ism is a, is a noun and the name of Allah is a noun. They have a relationship. What I called earlier the idafah. The name of Allah. And the idafah is always the of clause in English. Baytullahi, the house of Allah. Rasulullah, the messenger of Allah. Kitabullah, the book of Allah. Whenever you have two words that are nouns that have the same, that are next to each other, and the second one has a kasra, it tells you that the first one, more than likely, is has a relationship with it. Okay? Uh, So Allah is Jab, the name of Allah is Jab, right? the name of Allah, not Allah. And so Ar Rahman has Jab as well. Why? Not because it's an idafa, but because it's an adjective for the name of Allah. And adjectives always follow the word that they are describing in its state. So because the name of Allah is Jab, and they're both definite, in their structure, Ar Rahman is also Jab. And Ar Rahim is also in a Jab state because it's an adjective. And for those of you who may have studied advanced Arabic, you know that it can also be what's called Badr, right? a substitute or a positive. All right, for those of you who are more advanced. So let's go to the next slide. We'll look at the meaning first and then we'll go quickly over some of the grammar. So Alhamdu, what does Alhamdu mean? Alhamdu means all kinds of praise. In Arabic grammar, the prefix al, the prefix what? Al, can mean a number of things. It can mean definiteness, meaning specific praise. Or it can mean istigraq. All kinds of praise. Okay? There's like six different meanings for Al in Arabic. We're not going to go all the now. But don't just think Al means thee. Al can be many things. Even Tanwin at the end doesn't only mean indefinite, it can mean Ta'adim as well. All right? So Alhamdulillah here, according to the majority of our scholars, and we're not going to go to every single opinion, uh, means every kind of praise, every form of praise, belongs to who? Allah. Lillah. Again, uh, li and the name of Allah there. So that name, that word, lillah, is actually two words. It's li plus 
the name of Allah. Li means belongs to. It's a preposition, like these four up here under the Qafs, the Jab column. It's a preposition that, of course, is the name of Allah, Jalla Jalalu. Alhamdulillah. But when we put them together, this is what we do. We drop the alif of the Hamza to the Muslim. We drop this, okay? We drop that, and we put Lillah, and then we put a kasr under it with now because it's what? It's what? Great. Okay. So let's look at this. So uh, we already spoke. So Alhamdu, what is Alhamdu? Alhamdu means what? It was asking. Alhamdu means two things. Shukran. Thank you, sister. Athana wa Praise and thanks at the same time. It's one word because you can thank Allah and not be praising him. And you can praise him and not thank him. So Alhamdu means to praise. The different words to praise in Arabic. There's Tana, there's Madh, there's Shukr. There's different words for praise and thanks. Alhamdu means I thank Allah. The all forms of thanks and all forms of praise. Li means for, and then Allah, we spoke about the name of Allah before our prayer. Wrong, important word. Important word. Ra means the one who takes something from one stage of development to the next stage of development to the next stage of development and it keeps developing it, keeps evolving it until it reaches completion and perfection. Lord is a poor translation for the word Ra. Yes. Even though most of the translate the interpretations of the Quran that you have, the, the hadith, they always translate, they usually translate Rab as Lord. Sometimes you'll see sustainer, you'll see cherisher. Right? But the meaning of the word Rab is connected to the word tarbiyah. Tarbiyah means to cultivate, it means to educate. Excuse me, can you hear this word again? Rab. In English it would be. Nurture. R is the word. Right? Yes, wrong. Rob. Okay. Rob. The best word, Afwan, the best word that I know in English to indicate that meaning is nurture. 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 The one who nurtures. Nur to nurture something is to develop it, to cultivate it. Yeah. Rab also has the meaning of educating. That's why Tariq Ramadan, that's why Tariq Ramadan in his um, sirah, in the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu he translates Rab as educator. Iqra ismi rabbika ladikhar. Yani, it's not just saying he's the one who nurtured you, he's the one who's teaching you. Right? He's the one who's teaching you. Lord, master, in Arabic, is Malik, or Mawla. Allah indicates, as Ibn Ashur says, Rabb indicates Allah's kindness and gentleness. It's a very gentle word. It's, Rabb is a very gentle action. If you want to see Rabb, the manifestation of love, look at the plant growing. A teacher is called Murabbi. In order as well? Rabbi Maira. Yeah. Murabbi. Why? Because the teacher is educating the child. Slowly, it slow. doesn't happen overnight. It's very gentle. So what is what is it saying to us? Allah is Rabb al Alameen. Well, anyway, let's finish, we'll come back. So, Al Alameen, Al Alameen is a word that is, the root of it is Alamun, 
And it means those worlds, those universes of beings that have intelligence. And I know it's translated as the worlds, but really if you're translating the worlds in Arabic, if you want to be technical, you would use awalib, not alami. You would use awalib. That means the worlds. Alamun, Allah put the ya the nun. See that ya and nun at the end of alami? That ya and nun indicates that it's lil'uqala. It's for those beings that possess in intelligence. And the scholars of Tafsir say that Al-Alameen specifically relates to the worlds of the angels, the jinn, and the human beings. And the word, I see your hand, but this, uh, I see And the word Al-Alameen is connected to the word Alama, which means a sign. Because these beings, the angels, the jinn, and the human beings, specifically and primarily, and then all of creation, by extension, are a sign of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? No? Yes, sir. Yeah, so you earlier said that um, it's, a, it's a word that Arab basically says to take somebody, something from one stage of development to the other. To the next one. And then you said until it reaches perfection. Yes. Um, does, does perfection then mean uh, the end, or does that mean something different? Cause, cause, cause there, there's no about end. Um, so, technically in Arabic language, it does mean the end. Yani tamam, kamam, they say in the dictionaries. It reaches completion, like a full moon. You know, it starts as a hilal, the crescent, and it keeps waxing and waxing and waxing until it becomes a feather, until it becomes a full moon. So that is, that's the process of uh, development. But because Allah Ta'ala has no limit, there's no limit to His perfecting us. Right. So we're, if you allow Allah Ta'ala to teach you and to train you through your life, you are constantly reaching higher and higher levels of development and perfection. And completion. Because perfection means some end state. That's yes. what I wanted to understand. But because we're created yeah. beings, our perfection has no end. Because the one who's perfecting us has no end. Now Allah Ta'ala, His perfection is absolute, divine perfection that has no increase or decrease. We have relative perfection. Relative. Okay? So, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdu is in uh, uh, what state? Rahma. Lillahi, the name of Allah Lillahi is in what state? Jab. Jab. Oh, is in what state? Jab. Why is it in that state of Jab? Because it's a substitute for the name of Allah. Because when we say Allah, we know we're speaking about the Creator. When we say Rabbul Alameen, we know we're speaking about who? The Creator. Right? So they're interchangeable. Whenever you have words in Arabic that are interchangeable, they take the same state. So that's why the Rab ends in the cuss right here. And al alamin is also a noun, it's also an ism here, and it's also in the Jab state. But the reason why it ends with a Ya noun is because it's a plural. It's a plural. It was originally al alamun, as I said. But when you make it, Idafa, you put it in a jar state, that wow of an alamun becomes a ya. Alamun. Does that make sense? Alhamdulillah. So let's look at the next words. Ar-Rahman rahim We already spoke about what they mean. Who can tell me what states they're in? Jah. 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 Why are they Jah? Because they qualify. Lillah. Shukran. They add their attributes. They are adjectives of Rabbil Alameen and the name of Allah Ta'ala. And some scholars would say they're abda. They are substitutes because they're interchangeable. Right? Both are correct. Let's look at the next line. Malik Yawmidin. Malik means sawhead, possessor, owner. 
And as I said yesterday, there's different recitations of the Quran. And Warsh, it's not Malik, it's Malik. It's what? So if you hear an Imam, and he's reciting Fatiha, and he says, Maliki Yawmiddin, don't correct him. Like one brother told me, he heard me recite a Quran of Warsh in Atlanta, and he said, um, well, I thought maybe you made the six because you're American. Because <laughs> you're American. No, it's, it's how, yeah, the Prophet so I had taught the Sahaba to read the Quran different ways. And the Muslims who, who came here, uh, who were enslaved, the Africans who came here during, uh, through slavery, they recited Wash. So you can say the first recitation to come to America was Wash. Right? Right. But now, especially because of the Uthmani Dawla, the Ottoman Empire, um, and the Hanafi school. Because right? different Qiraats are typically associated with different schools of fiqh. The most popular uh, Qira is Hafs, Hafs, which we're going to be going over after Dhumma, inshallah. Yo, what does Yo mean? Wrong. What is, what is Yo mean? It, it indicates time. It's a period of time. It's a period of time. It could be a day. It could be 24 hours. It could be 50,000 years. As Allah tells us in the Quran, a day with Allah is 50,000 years. It could be a thousand years. Time is relative. We didn't need Einstein to tell us that. We didn't need Einstein to tell us that time is relative. It's in the Quran already. <laughs> but we have, you know, but, but Einstein, sometimes other people help you see what you already have. That's why it's important to study and examine every field of human knowledge in which there's benefit. Yeah. You just don't limit yourself. Don't say, oh, that's not Quran and Hadith, so I'm not going to read it. No, read theoretical physics. Right? Study other religions. So you know, study economics, study philosophy, right? Where there's been a, that's it, right. It's interesting, uh, Yom Kippur is yeah. also Yom yeah. in, uh, in, in Hebrew, and so there's a connection between the languages as well as said, study other deans. Yeah, um, and it's unfortunate that Muslims, we don't study the other Afro-Semitic languages more. You know, if we were really serious, we would study Hebrew, we would study because um, Hebrew is not Zionist. The language is not Zionist. There's Zionists that use Hebrew. <laughs> but the language itself is a creation of Allah Ta'ala. And Allah says in the Quran that every language is an ayat, the ayat. Right? There's signs in your colors and in your tongues, your languages. Amharic, right? ancient Egyptian. One of my professors in, uh, in college, he, he, he's the first one who told me about this. He was Palestinian that the roots of the Arabic language are found in ancient Egyptian. Like the word, like the letter Noon. Noon. What does Noon mean? Noon means two things based in Arabic. Ink pot and fish. That's why Prophet Yunus is called the Noon. Right? The companion of the fish. Noon in ancient Egyptian meant water. And there's many, many, many other words. Even the letters, the ba, the ba we have, actually in Phoenician, it was the other way around. It was not like this, it was like that. And that came from the Egyptian hieroglyph, uh, 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 bata, which was stood for house, bait. It was a glyph, it was a hieroglyph, it was a diagram the ancient Egyptians used for house, which is bait, and it was changed to this, and now we call it bat, but we still keep the word bait. Alpha, bet, anyway, that's a whole other thing. But we need to study other languages, especially the ones related to us, because like the more Hebrew I learn, the more ancient Egyptian I learn, the more Amharic I learn, the more Ge'ez I learn, it helps me understand the Quran. We can't be close-minded. Muslims are supposed to be, we're supposed to be universal and shahid over the rest of creation. 
Good, so let's keep on. Adin, so yom means a period of time. Adin indicates the it indicates al jaza it reward and recompense and the pain of a debt okay it has those meanings debt as well as reward it also means of course as we know a way of life why is your way of life called deen because that is the debt you're repaying to Allah Ta'ala he doesn't ask for everything he doesn't ask for all your money just 2.5% if you've had it for a little bit. You don't have to pray all day. Just five prayers a day, which maybe if you took it all together, it's like you know, 30, 40 minutes. A 24 hour period. That's, the, that's what you owe God out of a 24 hour period. And you can hide once in your life. Out of maybe 60, 70 years, you take a few, now it's a few weeks. You know, but back then it might be a few months, it might be a year or two to make Hajj before modern travel. That's so Deen is related to the word Dain, which means debt. It means reward, recompense, debt. And if you really want a really deep understanding of the word Deen, Google the article of Sayyid, Professor Sayyid Naqib al -Atas. He's a Malaysian scholar. Sayyid Naqib al-Atas, he's written many books. Uh, you know, one of, you know, his book, The Concept of Education in Islam, is a must for every Muslim. Anyone who has a weekend school or Islamic school or you're teaching your children, if you have children that you're teaching or other children, you must read that book. Concept of Education in Islam. He has another book called uh, Islam and Secularism. You, every Muslim needs to read that. Because many of us are Muslim, and, but our thinking is secular. And our approach to the deen is very secular. And how we uh, design our institutions is very secular. Uh, but if you Google his name, not his name, but Naqib Al-Athas, N-A-Q-U-I-B, Al-A-L, Al-Athas, A-T-T-A-S, he has a wonderful breakdown of the word deen and how it indicates justice, it indicates civilization, it indicates a sense of indebtedness and gratitude. The word deen indicates rain. One of the words for rain is related to the word deen. So to give life. That's why Medina is called Medina, because it's the place of deen. Medin, like masjid is the place of sujood. Maktab is the place where you write. So Medina is the place of civilization, is the place of justice, is the place of life, is the place of indebtedness, of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dayan is one of the names that Allah is called by. It means the judge, the just. So Malik Yawmidi means Allah is the owner of the day of reward. Day of reward. Or if you take the wash recitation, Malik Yawmidi, Malik means king. The sovereign ruler. They don't negate each other. That's why the more kira'at you know, the deeper you understand the Quran. If you know Duri and Asim and Nafir, the more kira'at you know, the deeper you understand the Quran. That's why Mufassir needs to know all the kira'at. Ulam. Amalikum is Ulam. 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 Yes, Malik. Yes. Ulam. Sahib. Yes, he, he owns it. <coughs> On that day, there's no uh, pharaoh, there's no tyrant, there's no. It, uh, everyone is manifestly enslaved to Allah Ta'ala that day. And Maliki, Yomi, and Dean all share what state? Jeff. Jeff, you guys are good. I'm going to take you with me on the road. You go with me to Alabama. You can teach grandma. Okay, now Maliki is Jab because it's a battle. It's, a, it's interchangeable with Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Yomi uh, is Jab because it's in Idafa with Malik. It's a noun, it's connected to Malik. Yeah? It's owned by Malik. And one of the relationships that's indicated in the Idafa is ownership. 
And then ad din is idafa again to yom. Yom of the deen. Remember, idafa is the of clause. The master, the owner of the day of reward. So look at what we'll talk more about this. If look, Allah Ta'ala, up until now, the names Allah Ta'ala has given us have been gentle names. Allah means the beloved, the creator, the one who bewilders the intellects. Ar-Rahman, merciful. Ar-Rahim, merciful. Rabb, gentle. Now, Maliki. So that you know that there's responsibility. Hope and fear to keep you balanced. But there's more hope than fear. There's more hope than fear. Iyaka na'amu wa iyaka say, Iyaka, you start saying, already talked about it, so it's a pronoun. And Iyaka means exclusively you. Or if you say Iyahu, exclusively him. Or if you say Iyaya, exclusively me. Now, Iyaka can be put at the beginning or the end of a verb, before verb, after verb. Allah puts it at the beginning to emphasize again his greatness. Iyaka na'amu wa Iyaka And so Iyaka is like saying anta. But it's more emphatic. It's, there's more emphasis. 